Firstly, I would like to apologize that I will be speaking in English. Um, it's much, going to be much clearer than if I tried to speak in Italian. I would like to say how delighted I am to receive this, this prize. I'm particularly happy to be amongst the extremely honorable list of previous winners and to be associated with this astonishing uh, academy and its, and its history. But today I want to talk about the studio and what emerges from the studio. But also to talk about things that are outside the studio but that are given meaning by the work in the studio. So I will constantly be coming back to the studio and the work that is done there. Because the work in the studio is the only justification as an artist for the ideas that are presented in, an, in a forum such as this. And the studio always involves practical thinking. It's both thinking about practical matters, about the paper on the wall, the angle of the spotlight on the stage, the hardness and the charcoal, the paper, practical materials. But it's more than this because the studio involves thinking through material. Thinking with your hands, thinking in charcoal, thinking with the gesture of an actor or a performer. Not to illustrate an idea, not even to find the answers to a question, posed as an idea, but at its best, the work in the studio and the thinking in the material releases the questions themselves. And I want to talk about this in relation to a specific project. But let's move from the space of this lecture into the studio, where all the fragments of history have a physical form. There's the postcard of Marcus Aurelius that would be pinned on the wall. There'd be a newspaper headline that's cut out. Um, there'd be photographs of refugees on the boats in the Mediterranean. There'd be a drawing I'd done yesterday of the widow of Rome. And that would be pinned next to a list of different tasks to be done in the studio. There'd be a photograph of a First World War gas mask. All the things you find in any artist's studios, filling up the walls and the tables. And so a walk around the studio is always a walk around these ideas. <coughs> and we walk around the studio circling the ideas, your eye picking up the different images of work to be done, of what has been done. And with this peripheral vision, things noticed at the edges of your eyes, there's also a kind of peripheral thinking of ideas that start to percolate and circulate around. Now, the thoughts that would be there would be the dream you had last night, the telephone call you've got to make tomorrow, this together with the images that you see around it. Now, this is, these kinds of fragments and being filled with these fragments is not the, res, the preserve of the artist as if no one else has them. But we all carry these with us. This is the way we all go through the world, picking up fragments, trying to make sense of the fragments. We obliterate some, we highlight others. But what the studio provides and what the artist does, not as a piece of instruction but out of necessity, is a demonstration in a visible medium of what we do all the time to make sense of the world. Combining different fragments together as if they had a natural meaning. So in brief, you can say the world is invited into the studio and it comes in in the form of these thoughts of memories, of photographs, of sketches, of books of art, all the things we are surrounded by in the studio. And there these fragments inside the studio are cut up, they're recombined, new elements are put together. And then this reconstruction of these fragments is sent back out into the world. As if we'd had all these broken shards of pottery taken from some excavation and we'd glued them together into some new vase and presented the vase to the world. Now, this collage, this making of the world from these different fragments is the common technique of artists. Not just in the 20 and 21st century when collage becomes a form in itself, but it's a working method that all artists have always used. So in all Renaissance paintings, there would be figures that were drawn in the studio 
and they are combined with landscape paintings to make the figure of a fetch on Petre, whether it's Giorgione or whoever. Caspar David Friedrich's landscapes are all taken from his sketchbooks in which he has drawings of different trees and branches, and these are put together in the studio and on the canvas to make the image of a coherent landscape. Rodin in his studio had boxes full of Greek and Roman fragments of limbs and copies of them, and when he was doing a figure, he'd find from his box the right arm to complete a figure. So the world was made up of these collages. But the technique of collage is not new. It's not even recent. But whereas for centuries the idea was to hide the art, to cover over the gap, so that in a Giorgione painting you can't see it's two figures from the studio mixed together with a, a landscape. They're brought into the single world through all the skill of the artist, through glazing, through matching of tonalities, all the skills of hiding the joints. Whereas now it seems the art is to show these gaps. Not just to show the tricks or techniques of the artist, but to show that the work, the work itself, is about making sense of fragments, to show the making of the image. So let's look at some fragments. And here we just have some torn sheets of black paper, and they're being rearranged. And that's this, it's completely clear what we're seeing. We're seeing torn fragments of paper, and they're being manipulated on the surface in front of them. Okay, and here, it shifts. We go from seeing just the fragments of paper to seeing Marcus Aurelius on his horse. Now, it's clear that what we were seeing were different things. We were seeing the black sheets of paper. We were not fools. We know that we were seeing pieces of paper. And secondly, we couldn't stop ourselves from seeing the image of Marcus Aurelius when he appeared. In other words, this desire to make sense of the world, to take fragments and recognize it, is not something that we do as an act of generosity. It's something that we can't stop ourselves doing. There's something inside us which pushes towards making a meaning of the world as those fragments come together. And then I would suggest that the laughter that we heard when you suddenly saw Marcus Aurelius is a third thing that you're standing behind yourself and watching that process of making sense of the world as suddenly the black shapes become both black shapes and the man on the horse. And so it's a kind of pleasure in our own self-deception and this is one of the pleasures we always get from art, from understanding we are complicit in the making of a meaning. And so I suppose this is what I mean by leaving the white scars on the shards of pottery when we put them together, making us aware of the work we do in constructing meaning. Now, the winged victory on Trajan's column is a different sort of collage. So this, as we know, was in fact based on an image from Greek art of someone learning to write, the art of writing. And then later on in Roman times, wings were added to this uh, to this uh, ancient image to give us the image of the winged victory that is in the central place of Trajan's column. And then we can take this image and we can break it up further. So this would again be drawings of Trajan's column, but seeing what happens if it's drawn on these different sheets of paper, and the sheets of paper are kind of combined. And this is partly what I mean of thinking in the material. There was a first drawing of, and then a second drawing of it, and then a shifting of the sheets of paper. So that the stability of the image, the solidity of the image of the winged victory starts to come into question. And what the very materiality of the paper, the fact that you can tear it, that it's on different sheets that can be moved about, enables this gradual collapse of the figure. So that we are seeing is not just the winged victory, 
But coming out of that, another image of the ravages of time and of the folly of grandeur. So even with the famous symbol of Rome, as we know, this image, in fact, is a collage. It's a Byzantine wolf, and the two boys underneath were added much later. Now, there's a, a third collage, a kind of collage, which is of different larger fragments, where you, aware, where you are aware that there's a collision of two different images coming together. So, for example, one could take one of the stone baths outside the Farnese Palace and place into that Marcello Mastriani and Anita Eckbert from La Dolce Vita and put the two of them together in a bath. We know that we are seeing a construction, and here what is being done, we're being set a riddle, which may or may not have an answer, but we are being pushed towards the edge of meaning, to being tempted to finding a possible meaning. We may find a meaning, we may ascribe a meaning, but we are aware that we are doing this push, that we are complicit in the making of the meaning of the world. Now, I want to look at these questions more specifically in relation to a project that was done not 100 meters from us here. A frieze on the walls of the banks of the Tiber River between Ponte Sisto and Ponte Mazzini, which is a distance of some 500 meters. The project was many years in the making and the project was promoted and pushed and brought to fruition by Kristen Jones, who I'm very happy to see is in the audience with us today who has long had the idea for the, this area of the Tiber to be a space for public art and to self-develop the particular technique that I used in making the, the, the long freeze. There were many, many people involved, some of them here in the room with us involved in this project. So, Kristen introduced me to the te technique which would, we would use, which was one of erasure. So, the travertine stone, here as we're all aware, in fact, Talking about Rome to this audience here does seem absurd. And I ask your indulgence for the mistranslations I will make of the history. I mean, we could also talk about the productivity of mistranslations, what we get from the pressure of trying to understand things imperfectly understood, how we constantly try to make a bridge over gaps in our understanding, in our meaning, a bridge over those sheets of paper suddenly turning into the horse. But at any, rate, at any rate, as we know, the travertine stone gets very dark from a mixture of pollution and bacterial growth, mainly from the bacterial growth. And to make a contrast between the figures and the background, the background was washed. So maybe just to describe very briefly the, the process. So there was a mass of reference material, which I'll get to later, postcards, photographs, things, computer files, sent from researchers in Rome, and I would choose an image to draw. So, for example, the, the winged victory. It starts as a charcoal drawing. And I used to draw them on old books of cash book pages so that the lines of the pages had some similarity to the lines of the blocks of the travertine stone on the wall. And then the charcoal drawing would be translated into an ink drawing so you have a clear black or white. From this it was possible to make a tracing, to make a, to make a stencil. So the image would be traced from the ink drawings. It would be turned into a computer file. The computer file was sent here to Rome where the image was cut out into plastic using a laser cutter. So the image grew from being the size of a book to being the 10 meter size of the stencils we needed. And then the stencils were held against the wall and then the image washed out with a high pressure hose. So wherever the plastic was, the wall stayed dark. And wherever the, there was a gap in the plastic, the wall would become white. And so the images would be achieved on the wall. Now, of course, being Rome, the temperature, the pressure, the type of nozzle were all controlled by many, many different commissions of monuments in the Belli Arti and the river authorities. 
there are, I think, 14 different authorities in charge of the river in Rome. So in a way, yes, the drawings were a work and it was a big job, but the primary job of this work was the arranging of the permessi, which was done. And this, many people in different continents were vitally involved. I talk about this project as my project, but we understand it was a huge collaboration with many, many different, many different people. So this process was done and it was always known that as the wall got darker, these images would fade away. And this is already happening two and a half years after the wall was made. Some images are still very strong and some are disappearing back into the wall. And so the piece in itself, in the material itself, becomes about the loss of memory, a loss of an image that was there. The wall reabsorbs the images. But here I want to pause to talk a bit about what it is to do a project here in, in Rome. And as I've said, there's something between our meaning and biography that can't be separated. When we saw the Marcus Aurelius in the horse, you were seeing black sheets of paper, but in your head, all your images of horses, of the sculpture of Marcus Aurelius, of other things you've read and seen, of films, come into your head and join the image of the horse halfway between the screen and your eye. And it's in that meeting of what comes towards you from the world and what we project onto it that the image is formed and meaning is made. So to talk about Rome. Uh, my connection to Rome and to Italy was shaped partly by my uh, father's love and enthusiasm for Italy and things Italian. And I'm also very happy that my father is in the audience with us today and also my wife and my daughter are here. And in my father's case, this enthusiasm was formed uh, as a soldier during the Second World War in Italy and later on as a student visiting Italy. And Italy was the first country I visited when I'd left South Africa, when I came on a holiday from South Africa when I was six years old. And so memories of this are deeply stuck inside my consciousness. So I remember very clearly peach ice cream on the beach at Levanto. I remember being terrified that my hand would be bitten off my six-year-old hand by the Bocca della Verità. Um, I remember the Carabinieri's hats. I remember uh, Fettuccini Alfredo, because remember this was 1961 when Alfredo was, very, was a new and very fashionable restaurant. And so on, and then through the good fortune of working with the great Italian gallerist Lia Ruma, Many, many projects, opera, theater, exhibitions have been possible in Rome. So I have a very strong connection to things Italian. I've done more projects here than in any other country in the world. And I thought I had a fair understanding of Italian history. I had a grounding in the art of the Renaissance. I had a high school understanding of Caesar's Gallic Wars. I had some high school knowledge of the Risorgimento. And so this is where the project started. There was a technique, washing the wall. There was a site, the wall in front of us here. And a pleasure at the prospect of working in this city. But as to what I would do, I was stuck. I made some sketches, some images from Trajan's column as if one was going to unreal, unroll the column. I made a drawing of Romulus. But essentially, I was stuck. I could find no more than a sort of tourist guide to images in, in Rome. While I was there, I did various other drawings. I read a book of poems about the ghetto. I did a drawing from research of the ghetto. And then I was amazed. Again, this is a simplification of a history that I give not for the history, but for the response I had to it. I'd always assumed that the ghetto was a pre-modern project, the Jewish ghetto across the river, very close to us, a medieval project. And by the time we reached the humanism, of the Renaissance, it would have been an anachronism. And so my shock was in realizing that it was established only in 1550, that's only 54 years before the founding of this academy itself. And that it continued until 1870, until Garibaldi entered Rome. So on the one side of the river here, you have St. Peter's, the Vatican, all the things I'd known, Michelangelo, Raphael, all the glories of Rome. In fact, my grandfather had given me a book of Michelangelo's Last Judgment when I was 12, and I still have it on my shelves. So all the glories of everything I'd visited on the trips to Rome were there, and on the other side of the river was the ghetto. 
And if you draw a line, as you know, from St. Peter's to the ghetto, you more or less pass through the academy across the river to it. But I'd never put the two together. There's obviously a chronological link. The ghetto was established at the same time that St. Peter's was being built. But I think there was more than a chronological link. And this is a, this is a, this may be speculative, but nonetheless it was important for the thinking that pushed the project. So just to refresh our memory, my memory, so Bramante starts building the church in 1506, and then Michelangelo finishes it, and it's completed in 1626. Now at the time in the Rome, even in Rome itself, the church was sometimes seen as a piece of unjustifiable vanity on the part of Pope Leo. And part of its financing, as we know, was done through the sales of indulgences throughout the Roman uh, Empire. And the break with the Catholic Church by Luther in Germany was over the sale of the indulgences and the payment for St. Peter's. And his 95 theses, which he na nailed to the door of the ch castle church in Wittenberg, which were the disputations of Martin Luther over the power and efficacy of indulgences, was about the expense of St. Peter's church. And so his conflict with the church was about the money that peasants and princes later had to pay for the building of the church. And only much later did Luther write his famous treatise on Jews and their lies. And this treatise was written at the same time that the Council of Trent was working out the response of the church here to the Reformation happening in Europe, trying to halt the loss of support in Northern Europe. And that is when Pope Paul IV established the ghetto. I think partly as an answer to Luther's claim that the church was being too soft on the Jews. And I'm sure this is a simplification of history or at any rate an abbreviation of it. We know that Pope Paul was very tough on, on everyone. He founded the Inquisition uh, to search out anyone who deviated from orthodoxy. He famously said, if my father were a heretic, I would be the first to gather the wood to burn him. So nonetheless, there, but nonetheless for me, there was a pressure of connection between what was happening on this side of the river and what happened on the other side of the river. And when this connection came, and this is the point, I didn't think how clever am I to have made this connection, but rather there was an anger and a shame at myself at not having understood this before. And I think there were three kinds of ignorance here. There was a hidden history. So in all the books that I'd read or the lectures I'd been to about Renaissance art history, there'd never been a mention of the, of the ghetto. There was a second which was an ignorance on my part, which was even when I knew about the ghetto, it was a footnote somewhere at the side separate from the, from the buildings, the monuments, the paintings that filled me. The context and even meaning of the paintings was subsidiary to the pre pleasure of their presence. And this is partly as an artist when the pleasure is looking, how is that sculpture made? How is that painting done? How is it possible to draw a line the way Raphael or Michelangelo was doing? But it's only half an answer to say that I was an artist looking at artists' work. And I think the third ignorance was an ignorance of not being able to put the fragments together. So even when I knew of the ghetto and its humiliations, and degradations it placed on its inhabitants. And this is in the not too distant past, right up to 1870. I did not make the connection to other histories. I could not see that the glory and the shame were completely linked together. And this became the starting point of the project, my own ignorance, my own embarrassment at my own ignorance. And the project became of one of finding a history of that was both triumphant and lamentable. And I think coming from South Africa, it is important. The South African history, which is large and painful, even now 25 years after the end of apartheid, the idea that history and shame go together is a very strong, is very evident. And in South Africa at the moment, the current dispute over what we should do over different monuments and bronze statues of different colonial heroes is a similar question that it posed. What is our relationship to a history, whether it is either heroic or lamentable? And I understood that every hero 
to a, every statue to a hero is also a monument to the disasters that left thousands of people bereft. So the task of the imagery of the frieze, the 70 or 80 figures that move along the river, was to make a record, and one of many possible records, let me stress, of the unbreakable connection between glorious and shameful histories. And these are the thoughts that were clarified in the making of the drawings and placing them together in the history. The heart is always in the studio. So it was hard to both hold on to the six-year-old's enthusiasm for all the things and to put that into perspective with the new history I was aware of. But also, as an art student, you need to hold on to those sculptures, the drawings, the frescoes that were part of the formation, not just of how I learned to be an artist, but still of how my eyes see, of how we see the world. But there was still a need to do this and to hold on to the dark underbelly of the Renaissance. But with this blindness, with the anger, there comes a kind of an energy, an energy for work. And it's an anger which is not at the story of the ghetto, it's an anger at my ignorance about that story. And this energy then fills the studio. There's an energy to start moving, to get things happening, for the project to get underway, underway for drawings to be done. And it speeds up in the walk around the studio. There's the dismantling and the reconstructing of the images. Let's see what happens if we put this pope next to that image from the ghetto, if we put this equestrian statue with that collapsed horse. It allows a series of sparks to jump, which is heated by the emotional energy behind the project. And now there was a need to choose the images, to find a balance between image and history. I needed a procession to walk along the river, like a triumphant procession or a historical procession, like the unwinding of Trajan's column. And then a team of historians in Rome under Lila Yorn, who is also with us today, started making a file of triumphant images, of lamentable images, and feeding the studio with these different histories and, and images. And I had a file of triumphant images and a file of lamentable images. And I would move one image from one to the next, physical pieces of paper moving through the studio. And I needed a mix of surprising unexpected images, idiosyncratic images, and a mixture of images that the citizens of Rome who would walk or cycle along it would recognize immediately. So there were many questions. How many different popes would there be in the procession? So there could have been a whole procession just of, just of popes. How many horses and equestrian statues? An equestrian statue is always an interesting always an interesting phenomenon, because a person on a horse always magnifies himself as if the hoarseness is in himself. So great statues of heroes are almost always include horses. There was a question of Georgiana Massi, who was killed by the police just a couple of hundred meters from here, whose dying words, o Dio che dolore, I thought should have had a place, but I couldn't find the right image of her that could move in procession. Later on, I thought maybe we should have just had her flag being carried by one person through it. And there were, there were connections. So there was an image of the dead Ramos from a, uh, from a Renaissance engraving, and then a photograph of the dead Pasolini um, from 1975. There were many different horses from Marcus Aurelius, to Anna Garibaldi on her horse just up the road here in the Via Garibaldi. Images that people could understand that this in fact was an image still in Naples, that's still on a fresco in Naples together with the bullet holes. There was a kind of the grandeur of someone on a horse when in fact we know all the portraits of people on horses are done on those wooden, on those wooden, st on those wooden uh, gymnastic things. This was a drunk horse on the sarcophagus. There was all the famous chariots, the horse collapsing in different kinds of ways. So again, as with the winged victory, there was a way of thinking almost aloud. Instead of walking around and talking to myself, it's done through these paintings of fragments and allowing them to find their, their possible meaning.
One of the tasks was to say, if you have a horse which is usually so grand, how minimal can the horse be? How can we show the collapse of that heroic image in the drawing of the horse itself? And as with the black paper I showed earlier, it's about what do you recognize as you see it rather than what do you know in advance. It relies on this kind of wealth of images we carry in our head to see what the image should be. So it had to do with finding the different images and seeing could they move laterally to be in a procession. So images of people looking straight ahead usually had to be put on a kind of cart to move across the stage. I think it's important here to stress the important space for stupidity in the studio, for saying this is a ridiculous activity moving these sheets of paper but I'll see what I can learn from it in the end, rather than judging the activity in advance. And that in the end became the final one of the final images, the collapsed horse. Now the the choices, of course, were personal as well. There were certain images that I felt I needed to have in, the, in it. So there's an image of St. Teresa in ecstasy, the Bernini sculpture on the top. There's the back of the car with Aldo Moro in the boot from that iconic images. There's the killing of different Goths also from the Trajan's column, a kind of a pile of history on top of itself. These different fragments of drawings landed on top of each other. There was Michelangelo's Jeremiah had to come down from the chapel just up the road from us here and preside over the, the people. There's an image of Haley Selassie, an image of the flood of the Tiber River in 1934, of refugees on the Mediterranean, a medieval image of the widow of Rome, Marcello Mastriani. I mean, this was not because it's a necessary image, but because that film and that image of the Trevi Fountain had such a strong place for me. Uh, the Masaccio had to come in because I loved Masaccio and also I needed some image that would come down from the top of the wall towards the bottom. So it's a mixture of historical needs and the formal needs and the biographical pleasures that come together to make the, to make the work. In the end, the center of the piece is the Jeremiah and the Winged Victory. I'm aware that each object had to find its place twice, once in terms of its historical association, once in terms of its visual narrative possibilities in the procession. And it, in the end, it is only one out of many possible accounts of history. The ordering of the figures is neither random nor is it scientifically worked out. It's a question in the studio of moving sheets of paper to find between the tables to find an order. Not interrogating the choice, but allowing the hand and the eye to make the construction of the piece. Relying on all the knowledge of the images, of the history they carried, to guide the physical placement. And then, of course, I stand back and look and rearrange them. So the heart of this project was made in Johannesburg, where my studio is. But of course, it had to be achieved here in Rome. And when almost all the figures had been made, I saw there was a gap in the river where the wall, in the, in the procession, where there was still a dark block on the wall. It was too late to make another figure in a complicated stencil, so we just had to leave it as a black square, tracing an edge to it, and on that I gave the legend, Quello che non ricordo. And this black block has to stand in for all our gaps, for our gaps of understanding, for that which we do not remember because it was hidden from us, or because our heads were filled with easier, more consoling thoughts, or because we could not summon the energy to make the connections. The studio is a safe space for these thoughts to reveal themselves in the months of drawing, for history and drawing to find their connection. But the city of Rome has been an astonishingly generous base to receive these considerations. 
and I'm grateful to the city of Rome and its citizens to have been, given, been able to give a physical form to this history. And I'm very grateful to the Academy and to all of you here today to have allowed me to play these thoughts out. Thank you.